Um, good evening, good afternoon. We're going to start this conference on uh, innovation and uh, uh, in in insertion, integration. Uh, how innovation is a, an engine uh, fueling uh, diversity. Uh, so thank you for those who <laughs> are sitting with us. Um, I'm really excited to, to welcome on stage somebody uh, I know personally and I know from work. Uh, he's awesome. <laughs> and uh, one thing I remember from him is uh, I learned to break shit uh, MIT style. Uh, and this is going to be with me all my life. Um, so I welcome on stage uh, Matt Carney, who's uh, working at the MIT Media Lab. Uh, he's going to tell us about his crazy work on robots and prosthetics and how they fit together. And after that, you will have another project presentation from Airbus on how we uh, uh, support makers and uh, diversity. And then we will have a round table about uh, diversity with human kit, my human kit and, and, and Airbus. Please, a round of applause for Matt. Enjoy. Hi, so you guys hear me? So uh, yeah, so my name is Matt Carney. I am a PhD student in the uh, biomechatronics group at the Media Lab. Uh, I worked with Airbus actually in my previous research group, which was the Center for Bits and Atoms, which you guys all may be familiar with because CBA started the whole Fab Lab network. There we go. There's the plane. And um, so anyway, so I, I joined the biomechatronics group in this last September in order to actually build uh, robotic prostheses for my PhD work. And I come to it from a background in mechanical engineering and human, humanoid robotic design as well as product design. So I'm just going to start jumping into it. I work with this guy. This is Hugh Hare. He is a bilateral transtibial amputee. He lost his legs when he was about 17 years old in an ice climbing accident. And he's since devoted his entire life to building robotic legs for himself and to enable other people as well. Um, and so we have this entire lab. He studied physics, uh, mechanical engineering, was part of the MIT Leg Lab, which is kind of where the beginning of uh, locomoting robotics actually started. And he's now developed this lab where we seek to try to merge the body and the machine by exploiting biological principles uh, that are inspired by muscul musculoskeletal design. So what does that mean? That's like, so we use, well, why don't we just jump right into it? I'm going to jump into biology first, and then we'll get into mechanical systems. So we're doing some kind of crazy stuff where we're trying to actually, should I use this guy? All right, is that better? OK, that's a lot better. OK. so. So what we're doing in, on the biology front is a few things, and I'm going to kind of demonstrate them. One of the things is that the, the whole technique of amputation hasn't really changed in the last 150 years. Basically, if you have to have an amputation, they come in and they'll, they'll sever your bone as necessary, and they'll cut the tissue and fold it up into a, a, a shape that fits well inside of a socket, but doesn't necessarily preserve any of the muscle or nerve bodies. And it, that tends to lead to issues with uh, phantom limb sensation, um, it can also, you know, even the, s the socket interface itself is not the most comfortable thing. That's a, a major complaint in people with, uh, that have to wear these prostheses. So what we're doing is we're actually re-looking at the entire amputation process in a way that we can actually preserve the muscle nerve bodies so that you can have sensation and uh, uh, volitional control. So you get proprioception and volition. And so what we're doing is, so the mu muscles work by a pull-pull mechanism around a joint. So so you have your knee here. I've got a muscle that pulls when I want to extend and pulls on the other side when I want to uh, uh, extend the other direction. And so that pull-pull is actually how you sense feeling in your leg. And if how you, it's part of how you sense the position of your leg itself as well as how much strength you're using. And so what we're doing is we're actually tying into the, uh, the nerve bodies. We use EMG data, e EMG sensors to tie on to the actual nerve leash that comes down to a muscle body. And from that, we are able to sense excitation of the muscle, but we can also send a signal back into that that simulates the, act, the, the, nerval res the electric nerve response from activation of the muscle. And, and that actually uses the wiring that's already in your body to go all the way up into your head and help you have a sense of how much activation you have, so how strong you're pulling, as well as where the actual position of your joint is. And so with that, you can then all of a sudden start to say, OK, I can put a human in the loop with the prosthesis. Because with active robotic prostheses right now, it's basically 
an autonomous robot that's attached to you that you're living symbiotically with. Like this device isn't able to actually sense anything that you're doing normally. It's, it's all it's able to do is sense how much torque and velocity you're injecting into it while you're walking around. And it steps through a number of different states, identifies its, its state, and then tries to push out that torque. So it's trying to figure out, am I in a heel strike? Am I going through controlled dorsiflexion or powered plantar flexion? I'm going to push off and generate a bunch of torque. But if you put the human in the loop, all of a sudden you have much more control over what's going on. You have much more dexterity with your limb. So what we're doing is we actually, in, the, in, in certain situations, we can actually preserve the muscle tendon body. And what you see on the right is the AMI system that we're now developing, uh, where we actually take the muscle and the agonist and antagonistic muscles, we relocate them, and we keep, but we keep them tied together. Or we, re, we actually suture them back together again so that you can still have the pull-pull action. It's just it's no longer actuating the joint. It's just actuating against itself. And so it's a surgical intervention that we're working on. And right here, you can see this is actually the first experimental amputation technique where we're using the AMI system, except we're using a surface EMG in this, uh, in this situation. So what you, see in, what you should see in the signals is that as he's dorsal, in this case he's dorsiflecting, you can see that we're getting nice, clean signal response because those muscles have actually been uh, retained rather than just folded up into a socket-shaped device. You can also see his muscle flexing in uh, in the amputation itself, in his body. And so Tyler Kleitz is a student. So I'm showing a bunch of stuff that I'm not necessarily working, but that what we're working on in the, in the MIT lab. So that's pretty crazy. Here's one that's even more crazy, I think. Transdermal optogenetic peripheral nerve stimulation. Let's see if it's gonna play. Are we playing? Yeah, here we go. Okay, so what this is is we take a virus and we modify the virus with a packet of DNA that actually ca causes the formation of a, uh, a gene that reacts to light. And we inject this into the peripheral nerve of, a bot, uh, of the muscle, uh, of the, the nerve leash, basically. And when we shine a certain light at it, it will actually react and cause an electric signal that causes activation of the muscle. And so what we're seeing here, is you can see 80 milliwatts ramping down but what you can see here is how fast this can actually react. So you can actually just shine a light on this nerve that has been modified by a virus. We've actually modified the DNA in this nerve and it, strangely it actually stays within that nerve body and we can then control the muscles. So what this means is you could have a wearable device that you could actually put on a paralyzed person and you could actually cause those muscles to be fired again. We're not the only ones doing this, but we're, the, but we've, we're increasing the level so that you can actually do it through the skin as opposed to having having to have laser fiber optics embedded into the system. So I think that's kind of the craziest thing that's going on in biology. And it just goes to show, you know, in there, there's all the fab lab stuff going on with, with hardware, but there's also biofab that's happening now. And it's starting to become really accessible to do this kind of mind-blowing work. Okay, so now on to the next thing. So now we're gonna step outside of the body and we're gonna go into mechanical interfaces. This is a thing that a lot of people have a lot of discomfort with. So as I said, the way we do amputation is archaic, and the way we interface with our prosthetics is also pretty archaic. Traditionally, what you do is you, a uh, prosthetist comes in and takes a cast of your leg, and then basically builds a, a rigid, often carbon fiber socket that fits onto that. That's cool because you need something rigid to transfer the loads, because you know, in walking, you're generating something like 120 Newton meters of torque when you step off. It's your entire body weight suspended over your ankle. But your body is not hard and soft all over the place, particularly, in a, for instance, in a transtibial amputee. You've got your tibia here, but sometimes you have your fibia hanging out over here as well. And you've got hard areas and soft areas. And when you try to fit all that into a really rigid thing, I mean, think about wearing clog, uh, clogs all day. You've got these, you're trying to fit something that's soft and hard into a hard thing. So what we do is we're, we're actually taking MRI data, ultrasonic data, and we're building uh, numerical simulations of the behavior of that hard and soft tissue. And then we're doing an analysis on it. So as we kind of step around this ring here, you can see we, we take MRI data, we segment it, we identify where the socket's actually gonna fit. Then we do a simulation where we actually simulate what happens with the body weight pressed into the socket. We identify high and, uh, high and low pressure zones. And then we actually use that to simulate, to, er, to then drive a generative design of a uh, spatially varying compliant structure that has hard and soft zones that complement the 
the hard and soft zones of your body. So where it's hard, we put soft, and where it's soft, we put hard. And so that, we, that way we get an even distribution of pressure on the leg so that we can actually, so that should increase comfort. Um, we're still figuring out how do we numerically define what comfort actually is, but we think this is a really interesting way of going. And the picture in the middle, that's Hugh standing there, and you can see the different colors. Those are, that's from a pretty fancy multi-material 3D printer, and that's showing different compliant and structural zones. And the next thing we're doing is actually based off some of the work I was doing at CVA with Airbus on using lattice structures to actually build this compliance into the system. And so we're, we've built computational tools that auto do a topology optimization that automatically define these structures so we get compliance through geometric knobs as opposed to ma material knobs that allows us to use more robust 3D printing technologies. Okay, now we're moving even further out. Now we're gonna go to exoskeletons. So another project that's going on is we're building an exoskeleton simulator so that we can actually identify, we can take simulation data that shows walking profiles for minimum energetics, uh, but then we can actually inject those torques into someone who's walking through an exoskeleton and identify how that, how putting torque in different places at different time affects the overall efficiency of walking or whatever gait style you want, if it's running or whatnot. And now we're starting to get closer to what I actually work on. So I'm a mechanical design engineer by training. Um, and so what I work on is the actual hardware, the actual device itself. And there's a, there's a whole number, there's a whole range of ways you can go about it. You can go, if you're looking for impact and prostheses, you can go with, uh, low-tech or high-tech systems, basically. So you can go with, like, the Jaipur foot, which is a totally passive device that has linkages built, built into it um, and that allows you to have, build these devices for really cheap and you put them in a lot of people's hands. Or you can go the other route, which is the technology direction. And since we're at MIT, we go technology. And so what you're looking at here is, uh, on the right is a, is a knee system and on the left is a two degree of freedom ankle system. And you'll, this is the first, um, one of the first, I think there's only one or two other two degree of freedom ankle systems that exist right now. And what this does is it allows you to have quite a bit more dis uh, stability and control and motion. And I'll show in a, a minute a slide that kind of demonstrates why you might want that. But the way, but so there's the mechanical device, there's also the controller. So this I'm gonna show, now I'm gonna show off a little bit. This is a robot I built back in 2009 uh, at Mecha Robotics. And what it's demonstrating is force control. This is something that's really important in a robotic system that's interacting with humans because a traditional robot arm is just gonna command to a position and use as much torque as possible to get to that position. But what you see here is there's a robot that's actually trying to move through space but only use certain forces at certain times. And so that gives you, it's called an impedance controller. And that's really important when you're walking because when you're walking and you're stepping down, you don't necessarily know where the ground is. And so you wanna use a certain force to get there, a certain impedance rather than just a position control. Here's a couple other systems we built at Mecha Robotics, demonstrating a couple other basic concepts of what we use in our mechanical design. Series elastic actuators are really visible on the, on the system on the left. That's a running robot we built for the University of Austin, Texas. And the, the series elastic actuator means there's a spring in line with your force actuator, which is biomimetic. It's similar to how the Achilles tendon acts like a spring while you're walking and stores energy and releases it. And so we utilize that both for measuring force as well as storing energy so you can have, uh, so you don't have to store all the energy in your electric system, you can store it in mechanical systems. Uh, and that plays into efficiency. And then another thing that's kind of visible here is inertial sensitivity. The more weight you have distally from your, from your joint, the more torque it requires to move it around, which means the more power you need in order to take steps. And so you can see in each of these designs, one, we have carbon fiber legs in one. The other one is made out of sheet metal and all the structures around the outside of the system. So we're increasing the second area moment of inertia, which is a geometric term for stiffness, which is actually much stronger than the material stiffness. And then finally, there's modeled dynamics. So this is another robot we built. Uh, me and my friend Amanda built this uh, last year. And this is just a swing up robot. And this is just for a class, so it never actually fully got working. But what we did do is we modeled all the dynamics of the system all the inertia terms. And we use that to use, to then apply that to an energy shaping algorithm. That's basically just injecting torque as it's swinging around, so it can then try to reach up and, and get all the way around. The other thing it shows <laughs> is that robots can be terrifying. They can be really dangerous. There's a lot of torque in there. That's a big hunk of metal that's swinging around. And if you're not careful, you can really get yourself in trouble with that. But, so the point is, is that we, 
you want to you want to model the system dynamics because then you can do really interesting things. That robot I showed you only had one motor on it and was able to swing all the way around and do all that behavior. So what we're doing is we're actually doing taking a, a bunch of math and throwing it at the program. So I, I modeled the motor dynamics, the actuator dynamics of the springs, the gear ratios, the uh, the inertias of all the system. I, I take walking data and I feed that in through this dynamic system and that tells me the spring deflection, the energy stored in the spring, uh, and the energetics of the system. I then take that and I run it through an optimization routine and I optimize all those parameters. And what that means is that I, rather than traditionally what we do is we build one prosthetic device and we, everyone has to use that. What this actually allows us to do is it allows us to have user specific stuff. Uh, user specific design and that's kind of what's demonstrated here is in the old days you have one device that is generally designed for the worst case conditions so that's a large heavy set person who's walking very fast what that means is you have to have a system that generates a huge amount of torque and has a lot of power available but on a smaller framed person that maybe doesn't make a lot of sense and so by running this optimization and taking advantage of uh, generative design and additive manufacturing we can actually make start to make devices that actually have user specific um, properties. So it's based on the gate data of someone who's more similarly sized to you. So we can size the actuator to say a smaller framed person. Uh, and then of course we'll do, and we go through the entire process. We do this at the mechanical design level, at the mechanical interface level, as well as at the gate. And so what I mean by gate personalization is that when we start adding multiple degrees of freedom to a system, so this is the two degree of freedom system, uh, and I'm running all this stuff through the Unreal Engine, it's a virtual reality system that we're using, uh, working with my friend uh, Guillermo to do this. And part of this is, one, it's just a nice quick way to show off stuff, but it's also, we can eventually get this into training users how to use their device before they actually have the hardware, because there's a healing procedure from when you actually have the amputation until you're ready to fit a device on. We can start putting you into a system where you can start to get a sense of how the system is gonna actuate particularly in the case where we're using the AMI amputation technique where you can start to sense and feel the force itself. But it also gives you a ability to have stabilization and it gives you the also the ability to have personalization in your controller. Perfect. So not only do you have, so every person has a different way of walking around. I wanna be able to put that personalization into your actual device. So it's not just the height, weight, match person that you're walking around as, but you can actually have your own control over how you're walking. And finally, that goes to maker spaces, which is by having access to tools, you actually have access to communicate your ideas better. And this, and that's like the, that's the beauty of all of this is that we want to add personalization to everything you do. And one person is not going to have the answer to all of your solutions. But when you have this access to all of this, to this freely available information, to this entire network that we're talking about here, you can then communicate to everyone about all these. Uh, not only and you communicate through building your own prototypes so that you can actually express what you mean through, your, through the technology and not just through some words or communication. So I think I'm out of time, so I'm just gonna leave it there. The rest is just more Fab Lab stuff that you guys know all about anyway. So thank you very much. Thank you, Matt, uh, really inspiring, super cool. Um, you made a good transition. You talked about uh, customization, and uh, you presented the functional part of prosthetics. We're gonna talk about the uh, aesthetic part. Uh, no, come back later. <laughs> you can say. Um, I want to welcome Christoph from Airbus, and he's now a maker, and he's gonna tell you his story. Okay, uh, I'm Christophe Debar, and I'm here to talk uh, about uh, what we can do in a Fab Lab for disability uh, and how to transform something that seems negative into something uh, that is positive. Um, but to, to, to tell you the, to explain you the project, I will tell you the story of the project. 
you will understand that it's a more um, a human adventure. Uh, I'm uh, an amputee uh, since the age of 13, and I, I live completely normally my disability. I think that is a positive thing. It uh, brings me a lot of consciousness, a lot of strength, and um, uh, the pro but uh, what happened is that uh, the people look at you in a in a way that is not positive. We are more disabled in the eye of the other than in our own disability. Um, there is a lot of prejudice uh, toward disabil dis disabled people. Um, for example, when I, uh, when, when I do sport, even I don't do things at a very high level, people congratulate me. Um, but if I do nothing special, if I walk in the street, for example, people look at me, people are uncomfortable around me. Uh, and sometimes I can feel some pity. And uh, it's not what I, I want to, to express to the other. I want to, uh, to, sh to, to show my prosthesis. I don't want to hide it. Some people don't, don't, don't wear shorts or don't go to the swimming pool because of that. It's what I call the, um, the, um, the psychological disability. And the, the goal of this project is all about that. Um, uh, when you look at the, the prosthesis today, there are issues from the mass production, and they are cold and impersonal. And uh, I think the, the prosthesis can be just more than just a tool that allows to walk. They can, they can be something to express your personality. Uh, if you take the example of the, the glasses that are made to uh, correct the vision, they are made for that, but also they are used as a fashion item. And it's what we don't do that for the prosthesis. And it's not new, it exists things uh, for, for aesthetic, but it's really, really, really expensive. It costs an arm and a leg, and for a leg it's very expensive. So when I see that, it, if something like that costs, uh, at this time, uh, it costs uh, uh, more than $4,000. So it's not accessible to everyone. Uh, so I decide to, to do my own leg. Uh, but at this time, it's uh, more than one year ago, I didn't know anything about 3D, 3D printer, uh, the 3D uh, uh, modeling, and I start to talk to anybody about this project because I believe in this. And uh, I, I think I, I was a little bit boring at this time because <laughs> everybody heard about this project. But as a result, I met one guy, uh, Thomas Grougon, um, from the, the Fab Lab, and it's how the, the project starts. It become concrete. We work um, in a little team, uh, start to design something, scan the leg, scan the prosthesis, and design something in a garage, um, and with a 3D printed uh, leg uh, scale one one uh, on the um, in the Fab Lab, it attracts curiosity, and this curiosity bring me uh, to know someone else. Hugo Bain and uh, Nicolas Huchet from My Human Kit. And from the, the project was, which was a little bit egoistic because I wanted to, to build my own aesthetic, after the meeting with uh, My Human Kit, it became altruistic and open source. My Human Kit is a great association that have a lot of projects that you can see it, and if you want to have uh, more information about it, go on their website. They, they, um, it's a, a, a way to create a social link because you don't buy a, pro a project, you made it. They only give the, the way to do it. And I'm completely uh, in this uh, 
in this uh, way of doing things, and that's why the project become an altruistic, and we give all we create, we document it, and we give it. And becoming altruistic and being for everybody, the complexity of the project augment a little, increase a little bit. So I decided, because I work in Airbus, to contact Airbus. And first, the, the people from human, um, human resources. And in fact, when I contact them, my human kit was already organizing an event called Fabricarium, who is the biggest hackathon in Europe organized linked to disability. And just for that, I, I think it, it merits your applause because it was, it was really, really great. Uh, 120 people working on nine projects linked to disability. And uh, it was absolutely great to, to break the prejudice again, um, towards disability, uh, to, uh, to, to, to mix people coming from different uh, origin. Uh, and we completely experience the diversity and the, the, the fact that uh, bring a lot of things to, uh, to, uh, to the project like this, to innovation. But before Fabricarium, I met uh, one guy that make me feel that the project will be completely feasible. It was Vincent Lubia, <laughs> who, uh, who really organized the thing, recruit a team, and uh, with the mindset of the, of the, the makers, the, um, that we, we start to build things. I, I, I had access to the facilities of uh, Airbus, and it's re it was really helping for the project. So now, thanks to all these people, I can present you the, the first prototype of, uh, of uh, Print My Leg. But I, I will explain you the process. It's, it's a three-step process, 3D scanning. We design it and we print it at finishing. First, we start at the Fab Lab. We, scan, we have scanned the, the prosthesis like this and the leg. And by, by uh, mixing uh, uh, each other, uh, we see what is the space to, to fill. Because what is important in this project is to remove the, the weird aspect of the, um, of the prosthesis. We want to recover the body shape. And by, by doing this, um, I think it's something that is in the brain that when you see the body complete like this, it changes completely the, the aspect of the, the prosthesis. After, the, the biggest part of the, the, the project is the design. We design. We first design on Blender, and after I use Kacha, uh, and uh, I learn how to use Kacha. At the beginning, I, I didn't know uh, how to use it, and people from Airbus helped me to to learn Kacha. And we design a fixation that is um, without any screw, uh, really easy to to assemble. It's a magnetic uh, fixation that you can see. And there is where there is a lot of, of work to do uh, at, mm, now because the prosthesis is fit my, uh, my body, but we need to, to find, uh, to design for every kind of prosthesis. It's, uh, it's a lot of work. It's only the beginning. And after, there is 3D printing. And so you, you print. I, I, I had the chance to use the facility of uh, Airbus. And after, the finishing. It's where you can do what you want. You can uh, paint it. You can do uh, anything. Uh, just let it uh, like this. Use a textile, whatever. We use the project called Lumilor. And I, I'm ready to, pr to present you the, the prosthesis.
It's okay? Okay. Uh, this is it. As you can see, uh, you, we have the complete volume of the, of the leg, and it removes completely the, the weird aspect. And the finishing is, is uh, really nice. And the, the thing that is extraordinary with prosthesis is you can light it up. <laughs> That's absolutely nice. Thank you, thank you very much to Luminor and Dark Side Scientific who does this, this job. Thank you. <laughs> Just quickly to, um, to tell you the next step that, that we see uh, for this project, um, we have to improve the process to build other legs. There is a lot of work to do uh, to uh, um, make it easier to, to build for anybody. After we can imagine, we can add connectivity to, to the leg. Maybe I, I want to to light up with my, my uh, cell phone. And functionalities. Uh, we can imagine photometer, thermometer. We can imagine add some lead inside. Imagine for, for a kid uh, who have a lead inside that, that reacts to this step. Uh, when, the, when you do a step, the light comes out of the, the prosthesis. Imagine the difference that is made for the other children. We don't see the disability like something uh, uh, strange or bizarre. Other children will be uh, jealous for, from this leg, and it changed completely the way he will build this life uh, concerning his disability. As a conclusion, as you can see, uh, without collaboration, nothing could, be, could happen. Uh, and this is the spirit of the Fab Lab that, that brings that, the maker culture and uh, the social link that create my human kit, uh, and uh, the fact that uh, we see that the diversity is a great, uh, great way to create, um, to, to create innovation. And the fact that we don't buy a project, but we made it, it's a really a change in, uh, in our culture. And I want to thank all the people that work on, the, on this project, uh, without them, nothing was possible. And I, we need help to continue the project. It's only the, the beginning. So don't hesitate to join us by contact, uh, by contact us by My Human Kit or directly on, on the Facebook page. Thank you very much to everybody. <laughs> Thank you very much, Christophe. I think that was uh, an authentic, and, and you didn't see the, the post which were live on the social media, but many, many comments on how sincere and authentic your testimony was, so thank you. You can stay on stage, actually, and I will call Matt as well, if you don't mind, because I would like that for those two guys who had a very, again, authentic, inspiring speeches, that we get them a very sincere, from our side, round of applause Thank you very much. So now you're not, you won't be alone. Um, so we had those two uh, pieces of exchange and thank you for that. Um, I'd like to come on stage, new friends. Uh, we've talked already somehow about them. I'd like to call Nicolas Huchet and Hugo Bain from My Human Kit. Please. And we'll have now a 30 minute ish, what we call round table. So this is obviously not a round table, but kind of an exchange. And we've prepared a frame for that. So around three questions to go a bit deeper on, on the exchange. Uh, but of course, we're open to and flexible. So if you really have a question you would like to raise at some point, we're flexible, you can raise it. OK? Cool. So uh, maybe. We have one mic, but maybe I'll stay there and you take the second one. Can you hear me well? Yeah, okay. 
So um, I've not introduced myself, by the way. Uh, my name is Johan Lacan. I'm working for Airbus. Uh, and I'm uh, in charge together with, uh, let's say, 136,000 people about inclusion and diversity. Uh, so really diversity, I think, uh, Christophe, you said it all, huh? diversity is, uh, is really a driver in terms of innovation and performance. We're really um, conscious about that. It's a business lever. It's about engagement also of our workforce. So, uh, you know, your testimony, Christophe, is um, really touching me. Sincerely, thank you for that. Um, and now, so each time I raise a question, I'll, I'll, I'll give you the words. Please introduce again yourself briefly so that people know who you are and what you're rapidly doing in, in your areas. So the first topic we have collectively decided to, uh, to exchange with you on is about actually the way of working. We were talking a lot in the, ba in the past about patents, by the way, you have a patent on that already? Uh, so about patents, about incubators, so really that symbol of being closed in a closed environment. Now we talk much more about open source, about fab labs, so we're open on almost everything. At least it seems so. So the question I have for you is, is that trend to really open up more and more a reality for you? Are you living it? And if so, uh, why do you think it's really a, a positive? Um, so, Matt, would you like to start? Uh, okay, sure. Um, yeah, so <laughs> openness is weird as an academic. So, I'm in, I'm, okay, so if you didn't hear me, I'm Matt Carney, I'm at MIT in the Media Lab, and I build robotic prostheses. Uh, mechanical design is my specialty. And, um, in the academic environment, it's actually very closed, and this is kind of an issue where we're not supposed to show things until we've published a paper on it and filed patents on it. And that means there's a lot of secrecy. And also the way the academic environment works, it, people, there needs to be the first author. Whoever the first author is on an academic publication is the one who gets all the results and all the effort. But when you're in industry, it's not quite the same. In industry, it's the entire team who's working on this. So there's, so there's I actually think that academics kind of, in some ways, limits your actual access to information and the sharing of ideas because the, the People who are trying to remain in academics are kind of struggling to be that first author. But I don't think that's helpful, and there are steps that are being taken. There's the Journal of Open Source Software and a Journal of Open Source Hardware that is just now forming. And MIT has just opened up uh, uh, open access to journal articles. So they now pit, so some journals will allow you to have open access if you pay some, it, you basically pay for the access that other people would have been having. And MIT is now doing that for their students. So. It, it's this kind of tricky thing where if you want to stay on that route, you have to stay closed in, or you can go rogue and you can just publish your stuff online and then no one can grab, then it's in the public domain. And that's actually a direction that I think is worthwhile going because like, what Christoph is working on is super cool and totally applies to the type of research we're working on. And what we're working on is, is super cool and can be accessible to people who have access to additional resources. Sure, you're probably not gonna do the surgery yourself, but you're gonna, but yeah, the rest of the tools are freely available. And I, I think you need to be able to learn, like you were saying you were just look for learning Katia in order to learn how to design this stuff. You need to be able to have access to the inspiration as well as the tools to, to share your ideas and, and be able to build on top of these things because complicated things like this can't be done by one person. So I, I think it's a tricky space that there's still a lot of room that needs to be carved out in order for us to really be able to work and share ideas. But uh, I mean, I will even sometimes just ignore some of these rules because it's like, <laughs> if you want to, if you want to make money right now, you're supposed to have intellectual property wrapped around your space. But that's all about lawyers, and and really that patent's only as valid as the strength of your lawyers, and really that means it's how much money you have to carve out the space to work in. But you could also just go publish it, and then it's in the public domain, and then no one else can patent it, and then you have access to work in that domain as well. So there's kind of these funny little places you can play. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. So talking about the public domain and publishing almost without asking, any, any insight uh, from our friends from uh, My Human Kit on uh, going open and open? Nico, you? Um, I hope you will understand my English. <laughs> um, in fact, we just finished the first other round table uh, um, about maker open source and disabilities with uh, 14 people speaking and only 
three Fab Labs and all the other organization, they were using open source and public domains documentation in real solving real problems in the professional fields, both NGOs, social centers, open research on biomedical devices, people working on legal aspects, trying to make perhaps what we are in the, in the field of open source, where open source software in the field of open source hardware, both covering legal aspects, um, licenses, traceability, and so on. And I think that, uh, as usual, um, we, we need every, everything, but we need spaces and methods to catalyze. And um, there is not only the technical part of the documentation, of um, the files on the versions. Um, you talk about finding inspiration, um, accessibility to the knowledge, making you able. If you have the courage um, to upgrade things and find your own solutions, and I think we need all of this. So what we need probably now is, um, is uh, both to explore the social and the technical aspects of the digital fabrication way, we can collaborate because it's not only technical things, you, you told it very clearly uh, in your witness. Uh, it's not only uh, a problem of uh, we must work about legal aspects of concrete objects, quality control of concrete objects, uh, the way the prototypes uh, invented in open innovation uh, could be legally used, including medical uh, devices. And it's happening now, if you work on it. After this meeting, you are working on it, you are working on it, you are working on it, we are working on it, you are working on it. Every of you who want the people not only to access of things on shops, and they are very important and good things in shops, okay, must work on this. So uh, I think that now the, the, um, the answer is going to to be stronger. Um, when I met Nicola in 2012, um, uh, we met people, and when I see today uh, the progress in the open source communities and projects among the medical devices or inclusive processes to mm -hmm. put the people to find themselves their solutions and being able to, to make it in spaces, uh, I think uh, a great, uh, path has been opened and many people are progressing in big communities such as Enabling the Future is for example 9,000 people on a Google group and uh, perhaps 500 people uh, making things for children without mm. fingers and it's working now okay so and, and less than four years so the, re the answer is yes uh, we must work on, on it and especially especially the experts of the digital property and of the technical uh, research because they are often today using the sources of the public domain and open source. So I think w w we must, and you have uh, between the two worlds, uh, uh, it's time now to, um, to prove and to found the legal aspects, to found the economical field in which the two models, historical and emerging, bottom up and uh, high level, academic, uh, should really now um, uh, should should <laughs> well, trigger, trigger yeah okay trigger something new should thank you thank okay. you Igor. so maybe uh, to build on that uh, Nicola any comments you would like to make so Nicola co-founder of uh, my human kit and Bionico hand and founder of uh, Bionico hand project which is uh, similar to uh, Christophe uh, how to build my own uh, prosthetic hand uh, why I choose to work on open source that I didn't know uh, is that uh, by working on uh, in an open source way I can ask anybody some help because the help I, I am asking from them is not just for me it's for other people as well so in that way I'm not afraid to say uh, can you help me please it's not for my business it's for it's for everybody's business in that way I'm free of the fear to ask people because when I'm afraid then to ask help I can think that I'm doing this for other people as well. So in that way, open source is important. Secondly, open source is a way to create this link you need between engineers, uh, users, you know, the, the people. 
people need to work together. Open source is a great tool just to bring people together. Otherwise, you will keep on creating very sophisticated objects that people don't understand why it was, it's, it's so technological. So that, that's why I like open source. Thank you very much. Okay, so for sake of timing, I said we would be agile. So I, I would like to offer to the room, first of all, do you have any specific question before we go to the next question you would like to raise to, the, uh, to our panel here? Uh, anything you thought was uh, probably to be digged in? All right, so we're moving on with the last question, actually, uh, on the vision. So if we look at the more longer term, so now we, I think, clearly all understood about the trend, uh, that, and, and you see that as a very positive trend to open up more and more. So how do you see what's next, actually? Can we open even more? Do you see, actually, a risk around opening more and more? And if so, which one? Or do you see, potentially, in the longer term, a completely different scheme that we are not thinking yet, but that you may have identified already? That's a question for you all. OK, so I will start. Um, I don't work for a company. But I was in, a, in, a, in an industry for a month in a company that has you know, patent and you work in a company that has patent. So of course, if tomorrow you decide to open up everything, you, you, you will not do it because you're afraid. Because it's, it's something new, you're afraid to lose your, your patents, your, the propriety of, of you know, what you do. Everybody is afraid because we are in a system like that. And I think it's... it's this should change. <laughs> this should change because we have to, I think in, it's time now in the history of uh, human beings and the capitalism uh, system that is to have uh, private companies and private of this and private of that. I think it's time to decide to open just to increase faster the innovation. We speak about innovation, but we don't realize how slow we are by each time somebody has an invention, each time he will spend a lot of time to protect it instead of just sharing it and make it even better. So we have to change the mentality of uh, the competition. We have to see competition in another way. Uh, in companies, engineers are into competition and they will even hide, I, I've been to some companies, you know, prosthetic companies, they even hide from each other what they invent to, to be the, the name on the, on the patent. I think it's time to change that. Okay. And the risk is that the tree, the tree of the system we are, work, we, are, we are sitting on, the risk is that the tree of the system will fall off faster than it's supposed to fall off. And this would be a good news because the system will change. <laughs> it will collapse sometimes. And I think it's important that this, the tree of the system we are, we are on, it's important that this tree fall off because there is a lot of new plants that this, this, and a lot of new plants that they are going out of the, of the ground and they need light to go faster, higher. And this is why we should free that. And the only risk we take is the risk of failing. That's the only risk we, we have. Thank you, Nicola. Thank you for listening. <laughs> Any other insight? Yeah, for me, it's, it will be a more in a personal way. Uh, talking about my experience on this, on this project, it's during this uh, adventure, I learned a lot of things. I, I, I'm more engaged in what I do. Um, and I think there is something to, to share that is not material. It is to share the competency. The by sp competency sponsoring, for, exam for example, you, you use someone uh, that, that is uh, uh, an expert in structure and he helped the project to design something that is more uh, more resistant, and it's not material thing that w that we can share. I think it's it's I think it's not difficult. 
to to give some time to people to work on this kind of thing because it brings a lot of value. Um, it brings a lot of engagement, and what the human resource want is that uh, it creates. Uh, it shows some something like diversity that is a, a great thing, and to to convince uh, industrials to to share their competency, it's good for the, the the project like this, and it's good for the company because their their people uh, will be more engaged. Okay, it's that's that's my point. Thank you, thank you very much, Christophe. In in a minute. Matt, your view? Yeah, I want to say one thing real quick, just kind of what everyone's talking about. So I do think that... Can you take the mic oh, closer? I think that quality is an important thing. And I, th and I think that just the fact of sharing your idea doesn't mean that someone's just going to run off and do it. It, you have, it takes a certain amount of energy and inspiration to actually generate these devices yourself and to, to, to build the thing. So the act that you share something that you've done doesn't mean someone's going to run off and steal your idea. It's, in some ways, it forces you to be competitive to actually pursue your idea and turn it into a thing and actually generate that, that thing. And also you can give credit to where it's come from. So in the academic world, it's first author, but in the real world, everyone did a bunch of different things. And, and when you collaborate, you can share those ideas. Like I love working on projects with other people because like you said, like I might help you with the structure, you might help with the overall idea of an inspiration of the entire thing or some little detail in somewhere. But Al allowing attribution rather than just first credit authorship allows for uh, allows for sharing of these ideas a lot more. And, and maybe there's some framework in there where we can wrap IP around I individual contribution rather than some indi some singular thing. But the the idea of allowing all that to happen and then having a certain level of quality attached to that for safety reasons is a, is a whole other thing. When you go open source and open hardware, you're building your own thing. You take you take the risk yourself. Whereas if you're doing it as a product, then that product has to assume, that company has to assume all of that risk. And so I think, I think there's space for this to be worked out more cleanly than how we have it at this point. But I think it comes down to, you want lots of people helping because no one person can do it. And it's just a matter of sharing that, that uh, contribution amongst everyone that it, it becomes this larger sharing thing. So yeah. Thank you, Matt. Anything else we would like to add? <coughs> at, um, and there are technical aspects, uh, legal aspects, economical aspects, social aspects. So I think many aspects has been uh, explained. It's very interesting. But um, without a long-term vision, we are in the Fab Lab Festival. And um, if you see um, when you are making tea, you take the water, you take the, the warm water, and you put the tea in the middle. And the important thing is not that it you don't eat the, the tea pocket, you know? Okay. But what is important is the water around. For me, Fab Labs is the same thing. No, I don't care that it's named Fab Lab in 10 years. But if the collaboration, the sharing, the self uh, estimation, as a um, uh, possibility of self customization, being in uh, kind of things that the other can also customize for themselves, is usable, is open, and you can improve and you can buy or build yourself and it's legal and use the level of control quality that's a vision that i like that's all wow thank you very much so that was our uh, our insight with two great testimonies and and that exchange with very uh, concrete questions about why diversity is, is really and i hope you got it uh, a lever to uh, to innovation but not only it's about people. I think we got that very clear. It's about co-opetition, huh? not competition, but about co-opetition. So really collaborative mindset and new ways of working. So I really want, again, a warm thank you to our friends on stage and to you for attending. Thank you very much. <laughs>